Okay, so last time we have started discussing the scattering theory, quantum scattering theory, and we have obtained an equation which was called the Lippmann Schrodinger equation. Let me go back to that and let me start with this. 1 over 4 pi d cube x u to the plus minus i k x minus x prime divided by x minus x prime v of x prime psi plus minus of x prime. This was an exact form and you see we have been able to construct the Green's function explicitly using some uh, sophisticated theorems from the complex analysis, that's the Cauchy theorems. It is exact yet, and then we have, let me briefly review, it's an important point, therefore it's worth reviewing it. Then we have noticed that there are some uh, physical conditions we have to take into account. That is, x is very large, in actual cases, as compared to the atomic scales or nuclear scales, kilometers in the accelerators, and x primes are small, as a matter of very small, because that is the region of the potential due to the nucleus itself or elementary particles. So they are very small. At 10 to the minus 15 centimeter scales and shorter, 10 to the minus 15 centimeter and shorter. These are nowadays kilometers. So that shows that if we have to really take the actual situation into account, the x prime divided by x is very small. Obviously, this physical condition will help me to simplify this expression substantially. There are two expressions which I had to focus. I focused on the difference x minus x prime mod in the exponential last time. Let me briefly review it without going into the details because I have done it. So we have shown that x minus x prime is x 1 minus x that x prime divided by x mod squared approximately to first order in this. Well, actually, when you expand this, you see that there are two terms. One is first order, one is second order. You drop the second order first, and then for the first order term, you use the binomial expansion, which is one minus epsilon to the power of one half, and that automatically gives you this. So this was then x minus x unit times x prime to leading order epsilon squared. Okay, it's obvious that to, to first order in this. When I sometimes I use as a shorthand in epsilon, epsilon is a small indication of smallness. Therefore, to first order in that it is this correction. So for the exponent, this played an important role, e to the plus minus i k x minus x prime then was equal to e to the plus minus i k x mod. The second term was minus plus i k x times x prime. Well, origin, the mathematical origin is taken at the target, so it goes from the target to the detector is x, target to the atomic that system potential x prime. So this one is the radial variable, right? Measuring the distance from the origin to the, to the detector. So the first factor is e to the plus minus i k r, and second factor is I identified the k times x hat as the k prime. Incoming k and outgoing k. Outgoing to the detector. 
Their magnitudes are the same because I am considering the elastic scattering only. So their magnitudes are the same, their directions are different. So this is the direction of the k prime. So it is minus plus i k prime x prime. Beautiful. So this should stay in the integral and this, this is in, independent of the integral, comes out. And so what did I do then if it comes out of the integral? Then I have noticed that, well these are stationary state solutions. I am looking at the energy eigenvalues for positive energy. That makes them scattering solutions as compared to the bound state. So as these are stationary states and if we would like to see the real time dependence, I have to complement the solutions with this factor. So then you put this constant thing, which I'm, it's not constant, but independent of the integral, if I, as I moved out, then we have analyzed the nature of this, the nature of this type of solutions. We have noticed that the plus one correspond to a forward moving, forward moving solution. Here is our picture, let me repeat it. The, the projectile comes and interacted and deviated at the target region. We take the origin to be at the target. And this is the x, okay. So k prime is in that direction, the scattered solution. And here are the plane waves, eigenstates of the momentum, because momentum and the free energy commutes. Therefore, energy eigenvalues are the same and simultaneously eigenvalues of the momentum, definite momentum eigenvalues. And these are the scattered waves that represented by e to the ikr and there will be one over r coming from this factor which I will denote in a moment. So when you analyze the sign with the plus sign, it means as time evolves or increases, so it's forward moving. If you check the negative energy, negative sign solutions, that's, these are mathematically possible, but physically it means the wave front is shrinking towards the center and disappearing as my projectile reaching there. It is, uh, the plus sign is a forward or retarded one. The minus sign is a backward moving or advanced one. They, these are not physically acceptable. So the only acceptable one is this. So e to the i k r is the only physically acceptable solution. The other one is to be thrown out. Well, there we are not losing anything because remember it came, the origin of that plus minus sign in here or here, here is the plus minus sign in front of the i epsilon. We didn't know which sign to choose, so we have behaved very liberally. We, we, we have put in the both signs. So we throw the minus sign, we retain the plus sign. It leads to the physically acceptable solutions. Therefore, the, I, I can now approximate this. The approximation is a very, very good approximation, almost exact taking into account that that ratio is 10 to the minus 20, almost 10 to the minus 18 or 19 or 20. Therefore, it is not really even an approximation, but still, technically, we are carrying out an approximation. But what about the numer denominator? What to, do, what to do with the denominator? Let me also carry that out. What is the one over x minus x prime it is? x minus x prime squared minus a half, right? That's the expression. One over the square root means there's minus a half. So what was this? This was x squared plus x prime squared minus twice to x x prime to leading order. If I write this as x prime squared factored one plus x prime squared divided by x squared twice x, x, x squared as before. I'm repeating what I have done for the exponent here. The only difference is that the signs are 
slightly different because of the appearance of this minus a half. Well, this is order epsilon squared. It's dropped at the first level. This is order epsilon. So I can carry out this as 1 over x. This is inside, right? Everything is inside. So it comes out as 1 over x. And then 1 plus twice x x prime x squared to leading order. This is dropped. This is minus a half. There's a minus a half. The binomial coefficient turns this into plus one. Sorry. There's no two there. So this is the approximation. In principle, there are two terms, right? Coming from that denominator then. It is this one. I will write underneath. 1 over x plus x x prime divided by x mod cubed. Okay. So, if we take this into account first. And then what about that one? Well, you remember, this is 1 over r. And this one is 1 over r squared times x unit times x prime, if you want. That's the expression. OK. So we drop that. Because already this is already 1 over r. r is at the detector very large. How large? Kilometers, right? And 1 over r squared is even further suppressed. Therefore, to this, uh, to the approximation we are uh, using, to the order of approximation we are using, we'll drop this. Will be dropped. And we retain only the first term. Therefore, our lipman schwinger equation becomes psi plus, now we, retain, we have decided on the sign. The correct sign is psi plus. Psi plus of x by the free solution minus 2m over h bar squared 1 over 4 pi e to the i kr divided by r d cube x prime e to the minus i k prime x prime times v of x v of x prime so it doesn't fit in here psi plus of x prime. Okay. So this is the new form of the lipman schwinger equation, which is physically correct, taking into account all the physical constraints. That is, x is large, x prime is small, etc. Here is this beautiful behavior of a free, spherically fronted, free particle representation moving away from the center, reaching the target. Now we are at a point that we can proceed now with more physics. Let me consult with the book so that I follow at least these steps. Okay. So we are at a position to define this so-called scattering amplitude, although we will have, and then eventually Born approximation and the differential cross-section, etc. So I will define now, well, this is, a, first of all, an integral equation. It's not a solution, it's an equation for the unknown. This is the unknown. We, we, we would like to construct this psi plus to describe all the physics, right? Including the scattering effects. It appears under the, under the integral sign, therefore, it is an integral equation. Eventually, we will try, we'll find a way of solving it recursively. But I've postponed that rigorous recursive solution to a later stage today. And we would like to follow the historical pathway. That is, we introduce now the scattering amplitude. Introduce the so-called, I write it as the so-called, because it's not obvious why it should be called the scattering amplitude. Well, it's going to uh, so solve us 
Uh, well, once we determine that so-called scattering amplitude, you'll see that you get most of, almost all the answers to the physical questions. That's why it's an important concept. And the way it is introduced is the following. Now, this is the plane wave, and we take usually the initial, initial beam to be that plane-fronted wave, that is free particle with well-defined momentum. So let's write this explicitly. What is this? Well, using the Dirac box normalization. No, not the box. Dirac, but first of all, let me start from. We have two different normalization for the plane waves. Plane waves are problematic, you see. We have discussed in detail the normalization issue. We have seen that there is the so-called Dirac normalization, which is a mathematical regularization technique to avoid the singularity associated with the norm, but not eliminating it, it's avoiding it. The other was box normalization. I'm not going to use the box normalization. We use, in the scattering theory, we usually use the Dirac's normalization. But I noticed that the newer version of the Sakurai's book, there is a new version recently available. Although the man is dead for quite some time, some of his former students are reproducing the book. He shifted back to the box normalization. Here it is the Dirac normalization. It's funny, I think, to make the new books look different than the original one. Otherwise, they wouldn't sell it, I guess, right? Anyway, I will use the original Dirac normal, uh, normalization. So if we write this explicitly, this lippmann schoenger equation looks like fo as follows. 2 pi to the minus 3 halves e to the i kx. K, as you know, in terms of the original momentum, it's p over h bar, right? So minus, or I will write it in a slightly exotic form, e to the i k r divided by r times 2m over h bar squared 2 pi to the plus 3 halves divided by 4 pi times, what is, what is it here, d cube x prime e to the minus i k prime x prime v x prime psi x prime. Okay, so we have grouped this entire thing apart from the e to the i k r divided by r and this entire block and there's also this square bracket, this entire block is given the name of F K K prime, the scattering amplitude. You should have been, you should have feel a bit uneasy about this. It is, as I said, before we really move into that rigorous discussion of recursive solution of this integral equation, at first there doesn't seem to be a mathematically rigorous explanation of this. It is just a definition as if. Why I feel a bit uncomfortable about this? On behalf of you. I know the answer, but on behalf of you, because this is sort of a number involving k and k prime, but hidden in it is the psi plus. You may say psi plus is the unknown and we are trying to determine it. We leave it in the left hand side as if this is determined and I still keep this psi plus in there and call it scattering amplitude. At first reading in a, of any book you may feel a bit upset. But there is a beautiful explanation of it in the context of the so-called Born approximation which is the simplest of a recursive approximations which I will teach you in, a, in the next hour or so. So it's not problematic, but if you feel a bit uncomfortable, it's okay that you should feel uncomfortable about this. That's what I'm saying, okay. So if this is the scattering amplitude, once defined in that manner, let's check the consequences of that definition. What are the physical consequences? So my solution then, is written 
well, approximation means x prime is small, x is large. So all these physical conditions are taken into account. 2 pi to the minus 3 halves phi, no, no, it's explicitly i, kx, f, f is k and k prime, or I will an equivalently feasible way of writing it, f k theta. What does it mean? Now it's, it's an elastic scattering, right? So initial and final moment have the same magnitudes. If they have the same magnitudes, this notation is the common magnitude of the initial and final. Theta is the scattering angle. So it is the, in terms of these two parameters, you are expressing the scattering amplitude. And all the rest, this is the incoming one. Okay, incoming one. And that's the outgoing one. It's frankly fronted. So it is written, the general solution of this scattering problem is written in such a way that it contains two pieces. One is the incident, incoming one. The other one is the outgoing or scattering one. The sum linear superposition is, of course, it should be present together, represents the physical process, the complete physical process of scattering. Now, if, in order to proceed further, I would like to, uh, oh, by the way, perhaps it's, it may be a little relevant in here that I should elaborate on the different versions of this scattering amplitude. Let me write that scattering amplitude and show you that there's a simplified, notation-wide simplified version. Okay, so what is my, now, uh, F, which appears in there, let me rewrite it. 2m over h bar squared, 2 pi 3 halves divided by 4 pi, d cube x prime e to the minus i k prime x prime v of x prime psi plus of x prime. You see, it is not a very simple expression for obvious reasons. Now I claim that it can be written in the following fashion. A second way of writing it, 2 pi cubed divided by 4 pi. Notice that I'm not simplifying the, these 2 pi's or 4, 4 pi's because they are going to disappear eventually. So it is much better to keep them as they are. K prime V. So I say that this is also an equivalent and simplified version of expressing this scattering amplitude as we have obtained. Well, either you can directly go one way or the other way. It's easier to go from the second version to the first version. How do we do that usually? We well, notice that this is a Hilbert space vector or the dual of it, of the k momentum. An eigenstate of the k prime momentum. How do I convert into a wave, these into wave functions so that I see this wave function, and also this is part of that wave function, right? Conjugate e to the i k x or e to the minus i k x are the momentum eigen functions. So you insert here and completeness sum. And you insert there another completeness sum. of the position operator eigenvectors. And so what you get then, from, let, let me focus on this expectation value only, not the complicated the notation, double d cube x, d cube x, prime and d cube x, k prime, x prime, x prime v, x, x, psi plus. You see, once you know the formalism and techniques, then life is quite easy. What is this? This is the eigenvector of the momentum conjugate. So it is e to the minus i k prime x prime in the normalization, t 
Dirac normalization to apply to the three halves. This is psi plus of x. What about the middle? Middle one is the vx using the locality assumption that we have used already, vx of delta cube of x minus x prime. Carry out the x prime integration because there is a delta, then you get that expression explicitly. But this is a very handy notation and particularly when we go to that rigorous uh, discussion of the recursive solution, we are going, this will prove to be quite handy. So let's pay attention that there, it exists, that form exists. And let's proceed with the physical interpretation. And for the physical interpretation then, first I have to introduce the concept of differential cross-section. Differential cross-section. I will write it in plain English and then we'll try to come up with a mathematical expression associated with this. We denoted that d sigma, it's the differential, you'll see the reason why it is the differential one. A number of particles, scattered into solid angle the omega per unit time the numerator is a rather lengthy expression so number of particles scattered into solid angle the omega per unit time as normalized by the incident flux incident flux Incoming flux is much better, perhaps. Incoming flux. Flux is number of particles falling on a unit area at the target per unit time. So numerator is per unit time, denominator is per unit time, per unit area. Per unit times cancel, then area comes up, and this has in the dimension area. So this is the notation of dimension, it's the area. Length squared, because of the area hidden in the definition of the flux. Okay. Now notice that all of a sudden, from the quantum mechanical concepts and entities, like wave function, scattering amplitude, incident wave particle, incident particle wave function, outgoing particle wave function, etc. Now we are talking about number of particles. How do we go from here to there? That's a very difficult concept. And when you look at several books, you won't see that it's that explicitly explained. It's rather cumbersome. I will write it that the mathematical statement is stupidly simple, but to actually appreciating how do you pass from quantum mechanical entities which describe probability waves, not actual particles or waves. So psi represents a probability wave function. It doesn't correspond to a charge density wave of a part material wave or anything. So how all of a sudden you go to the concept of particles? So for that, what we have to do is the following. We consider a large number of identically prepared particles. Consider a large, large is indeed large, number of identically prepared
What does it mean? Why do I need to do anything like that? We said initial beam, this particular way of representing it means they are taken to be the exact eigenfunctions of the momentum operator. Momentum is the quantum label. They are free, therefore they are also eigenfunctions of the energy and moment, free Hamiltonian and the momentum operator commute, therefore energy eigenfunctions are simultaneous eigenfunctions of momentum. That's their definite momentum eigenfunctions. Preparing them to be, preparing them identically means they are all momentum eigenfunctions, carrying all the same, all of them carrying the same momenta. And there's a large number indeed, there are in the beams, that's called the luminosity of the, be the uh, beams in the particle accelerators. There are indeed large numbers, very, very large numbers, order 10 to the 20s. Therefore, this is not difficult to achieve. However, to be 100% to be sure that they all carry exactly the same momentum is technically quite difficult. That's, the miracle people are creating at the LHC, creating all of them to be in the same, exactly to have the same momentum. Okay, then we ask what is the number of incident particles crossing a plane perpendicular to the incident direction per unit area per unit time? That is, what is the incoming flux once that is given? Flux in coming is here is the target. This is the unit area. Target is sitting somewhere in here. We have to think of a cylinder. Remember this type of argument I have used previously when I was doing the radiation problem, right? The radiation flux of the incident radiation. Well, this is the area one. This is, what is that measure of that height of the cylinder? The average velocity, right? Here average velocity of the incoming beam, whatever it is, proton or antiproton or electron or something like that, right? The scattering or perhaps going back to Rutherford times the alpha nuclei, okay? So V, V average. For light was, for, it was, for the light it was C because the, this, the distance covered by the light particle in per unit time, it is the, this particular object, V. And also, if there are, this is the volume. So volume of the cylinder is V. Number in this volume is the number of particles per unit volume, number density of the, or it is really number density of the initial beam times V bar. Okay, what is this V? We are moving from quantum mechanical realm to the laboratory. It's the correspondence principle. In the laboratory what you have is really what? The current, there is a current which is associated with the motion, right? We know that if there is a decrease in the probability is the density somewhere, then it must, there must be an outflow of the current, right? Probability, an outflow of the probability decreases, an inflow of probability increases it. How is it dictated? How is it regulated? The conservation of probability is regulated by this equation. The change in the density is proportional to the outflow or inflow of the probability current density. So it is this thing which is associated with the motion or kinematics or the velocity, right? Let's demonstrate this. We can demonstrate it <coughs> in two ways. One is more formal, the other is more explicit. Let's remember the form of this current. What was the form of this current? J is equal to H bar over 2mi psi star del psi minus the complex conjugate, right? This is the form of the probability current density which we have obtained 
from that expression. I don't think it, there is a need for redoing it, right? You all know it quite well, that you can drive it that way. Let's try to rewrite it slightly differently. If I remember that in this space of wave functions, h bar over i times the gradient operator is the momentum operator, I can write it as 1 over 2m psi star p operator psi plus the Hermitian conjugate. Notice that the countless conjugation in the upper line is translated or transformed into Hermitian conjugate in the second because the i's and everything are moved in. Well, obviously, this thing is, in order to ensure the hermeticity of the j, this is really nothing but writing this plus the Hermitian conjugate and averaging, taking the one half, it makes it Hermitian. If you want, you can move the m in. I'm doing it slowly and step by step because sometimes these trivial, trivial concepts may become quite crucial in many contexts. What is this? This is the V operator, isn't it? So it is the psi star and psi, V operator is in between and Hermitianized. So that shows that there is a relationship in the correspondence, in the sense of quantum mechanical correspondence principle between the J and the V. And there's a sandwich of psi. If psi was a simple plane wave, it could have been a little more e e transparent, perhaps, like psi, let's take it, forget the normalization, whichever normalization you like. If you take it to be e to the i over h bar p dot x, we take it to be a momentum eigenstate, right? We put the label p, saying that it is a definite state of momentum. Then, if you substitute this up, p operator acting on this gives you what? p operator on psi p gives you the p directly psi. Therefore, now this is the eigen, this is p operator and that's the eigenvalue p, number now. Numbers comes out and one half cancels and for this particular one, j becomes what? j becomes the following, p over m, p over m times psi mod squared. Psi mod squared is for this plane wave is nothing but the n squared. So v times n squared. The, as this is an eigenstate of the de definite momentum, it's an eigenstate of definite velocity as well. So you see j's and v are up to that normalization factor are really related <laughs> proportional. Good. I'm doing this a, a rather sophisticated discussion which has sort of a very profound a hidden philosophical dimension in it to convince you that from uh, this V is the one which enters in here. What is really V in quantum mechanics is the J itself, right? Okay, up to normalization constant, we are going to use the same normalization everywhere. So this is the actual numbers in the lab and the probability waves of quantum mechanics, how they are intermingled and related. So we'll proceed in this manner. I hope this is not mixed up with the others. Once that is understood, then we'll proceed to compute the flux, well, the differential cross-section that I have written there, where here. After that introduction, in the next hour, we will discuss in detail how this comes about, okay? So it's a good point to give a break.